find Paul making strong statements about God's love for him and also his love for God. Paul loved God. And um, there was this relationship in spite of strong adversity, strong adversity of the day. And he said here in Romans 8.35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Then in verse 37, he said, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Doesn't matter what's going on in our lives, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to talk to you for a bit tonight with the help of the Lord on this subject, nothing shall separate us. Nothing shall separate us. Before you're seated, Sunday morning, love not the world, be here love not the world and we're going to be talking about God's word being the final authority I don't care what this person says I don't care what that person says I really care what the word of God has to say so we're going to get into the some unique things Sunday morning we're going to talk a little bit more about what God expects of his children a lot of people think all God expects of his children is to go to church. That's not even close to what it's about. And so we're going to be talking about uh, love not the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I regularly spend a lot of time in Psalm. I like the way David thought. He was about more than just Um, he was about more than just going through the motions. He was about having a relationship with God. And so I read, really, Psalm 139 is just regular. It's, It's just, I read that regularly. And there's a reason I do. The reason being this passage speaks like few others to God's love, to God's care, his hands-on involvement in our lives. It speaks to his protective covering upon his people, as well as his persistent, consistent guidance. In fact, I'm going to take a few moments here tonight and read again David's view of all God had meant to him during this particular season in his life. Psalm 139, again, is a song written by David, and it's written for the chief musician. And this song is kind of like church. When churches get hold of a good song, they sing it till the wheels fall off. (laughs) You might hear it once a week or twice a week or... You might hear it for many months. David's song went like this, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compasseth my path and my lying down. The point being, God, you've got me protected as I walk through this world. You've got me covered even while I'm asleep. So thou compasseth my path and my lying down and art acquainted 
with all of my ways. God, you know me in the good times. You know me in the bad times. You know me when I'm in the backyard pitching a fit about something that needs to have a fit pitched. <laughs> you know me when I'm, when I'm being so merciful and so kind. You know me at all times. You just know me. You know me when I'm up, when I'm encouraged. You know me when I'm down, and I gotta look up. I gotta look down. I gotta look up to look down. You know what I mean? You've heard that saying. Verse four: For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. God, if I say it, You hear it. If I say it, You know it. Verse five: Thou hast beset me behind and before, and You've laid Your hand. Up on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. David was really having a hard time adequately measuring God's goodness here. So he acknowledged his own limitations, and then to the best of his ability, he sang this song that he had written, and he, and he sang of God's goodness. He sang praise to his God. He sang, God, I've seen what you've done in my life and all around me. I've, I've spoken to others about what you've done. I've, I've been able to put my hands upon the miracles that you have performed. In other words, I was there where you performed that miracle, and I put my hand there, and I knew that you had worked a miracle there. <laughs> Hallelujah. My five senses. This is the way I see this, folks. It's like David was saying, even my five senses, man, they are tingling all the time when I'm in your presence, my spirit recognizes your greatness. Again, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I just can't do you justice, mighty one. Anybody ever feel like that? God's been so good to you that no matter how much you sing his praises, it, you can never make it as good as it really is. You can never make it sound as good as it really is. I've been there. Amen. Then in verse 7, we find, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. I'm not talking about here the burning place. He's talking about the grave. If I make my bed in the grave, if I take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light. About me, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are alike. They're both alike to thee. I don't know if we realize this, but David was pretty well versed at hiding from his enemies. He evaded the Philistines while living, while, while living right under their very noses. He evaded Saul for what seemed like forever. He would just slip through a little tight spot and Saul couldn't catch him. And, um, and so he was, he, he was pretty well versed at hiding from his enemies. And However, where God was concerned, no matter where David went, God was with him. He was that ever-present help in time of trouble. God was the source of of his strength, and he recognized this. God supplied his power and his comfort to this man. He cared for David, and it showed where David was concerned, God was as close. I mean, he was truly as close as the mention of his name. And in verse 13, we find, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast possessed my reins, and Picture in your mind a horse here. The bit is in the horse's mouth. The reins are in the hands of the rider. The rider is directing the horse by manipulating the reins. I really don't know if you've considered this, but for God to possess the reins, 
to David's life, David had to yield those reins to God. He had to be willing to say, God, you take over. God, you order my steps. God, you make my way perfect. God, you lead me around obstacles. So for God to have the reins of David's life, David had to say, here are the reins of my life. And so I ask this question tonight, have you turned the reins of your life over to God? Well, I'm not getting anybody saying, yeah. Have you turned the reins of your life over to God? Is God leading you? Is God directing you? Have you allowed God to move you where he wants you to go? If you haven't, then you're living for God the hard way. Because you're going where you want and not where God wants. And hear me now, David did not want to do it his way. David then continued with, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Think about this. Before David breathed his first, God had him hemmed in. He had him covered up. He had him protected. And let me add something else. God is no respecter of persons. And so just as God had David covered up, just as God had David protected, He's had you covered up. He's had you protected. Even before you were born, he knew that you would serve him. Hallelujah. God just looked. It wasn't that he predestinated an action. He just knew. And so he wanted to know everything about you. He wanted to see you from the beginning. He wanted to be a part of your life. Even before you came from the womb, God knew you. I'm telling you, God is a personal God. And David said in verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Now the translation reads, I thank you, high God, you are breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. You see, God knows your name. I said, God knows your name. He knows everything there is to know about you. Every single one of you are open books to the Lord. All stages of your life, they've been spread out before him. Ha! The approaching days of our lives, I just believe this with all my heart, they were blessed Hallelujah, before we even lived in any of them. Now you say, oh, that sounds like predestination. No, that not, has nothing to do with predestination. It has to do with, hallelujah, knowing what you would do and how you would do it. Well, anyway, hallelujah. Praise God. God knows your name. That's powerful. And back to Psalm 139, verse 17. In good old King James, which I believe in. I'll tell you what, those translators, they were not about religion. They were about what the original text had to say. They were not about making the book fit their particular belief. They were about 
It didn't matter what their belief was. It was what the original text said. So Psalm 139, 17, how precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. He's saying God's thoughts about him were precious thoughts. If I could count them, if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. You see, church, I believe this with all of my heart. God literally communed with David. David spoke to God. God spoke to David. And it's my belief that from time to time, David just found his way into that secret place. And while there, he picked up on God's thoughts, God's opinions, God's ways. And I know this because of the prophecies, the foretellings David wrote about. It was David who wrote 1,000 years before Jesus was on this earth. It was David who wrote of his coming crucifixion. We find this Psalm 22, 1, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. So a thousand years before Jesus was nailed to that cross, David somehow or another found his way into that secret place. And he's locked up and he's learning. And he's hearing and he's knowing. <laughs> Whew, I'm telling you something. We, every single one of us, can have a relationship with God. Well, I got to wait to hear the preacher preach. I'm telling you, you can go to your knees every day. If your can't, knees can't take it, kind of like mine, you can sit on a pew and just talk to the Lord. Just tell him how much you love him. And I'll tell you what, he'll start talking back. He might not speak like I'm speaking to you, but it might be by impression. But He'll speak to you. He'll speak to you. He'll give you direction in your life. Again, David had a spiritual knack for locking in on the mind, the heart of God. He saw what was coming. And then back to Psalm 139, verse 19, we find, Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? I'm telling you, David is, he's on God's side here. If they hate you, I hate them. And am not I greed with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Why? Because they hate you, God. Search me, O God know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I really want us to grasp this tonight, church. Nothing shall separate us from God's love. Nothing shall separate us from God's love. Temptations may come, but they can never separate us from God's love. Pride cannot separate us from God's love. God will knock you on the head and beat the pride out of you until he can work with you again. I'm telling you, God loves you enough to spank you enough to get the pride on out the door. Doubt can't separate us from the love of God. God's going to prove himself. He's going to show himself in manifold ways. He's going to get through to you some way. One way or another, he's going to get through to you. The lies of the devil cannot separate me from the love of God. Insecurity cannot separate me. Fear cannot separate me. Confusion cannot separate me. Listen to me now. Even a prodigal spirit can't separate me from God's love. 
And the reason I say this is even when the prodigal was in the hog pen contemplating eating the hog slop, God was still dealing with him. I want you to understand, parents, backslidden children are never forgotten by God. They might act as though they're forgotten. However, don't believe it for a minute. You say, well, my kids don't want anything to do with God. Oh, my goodness. When you're not there, God is stirring that heart. He is digging them up. He is churning in there. He's putting them, he's allowing them to go through things so they'll be in that old hog pen and, and start thinking at my daddy's house, even the servants get better than I'm getting here. Backslidden children are never forgotten by God. They can run, but they cannot hide. Hallelujah. Let's look at the prophet Elijah for a few minutes here on this evening. First Kings chapter 18, we find Elijah and his contest with the false prophets of Baal in the grove. You know there had been a terrible drought in the land. It had not rained for three and a half years. First Kings 18, 17, we find it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah. And Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all children unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450 and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And now Elijah is about to get everybody keenly focused on right and wrong and on righteousness and sin. Next line, verse 21, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. In other words, they didn't want to pick up sides. Show me something and maybe I'll pick a side, but not yet. Then Elijah said unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on wood, put no fire under it. I will dress the other bullock, lay it on wood, put no fire under, and call on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the false prophets of Baal, choose you one bullock for yourself, dress it first for you or many, call on the name of your gods, but again, put no fire under. They took the bullock which was given them, they dressed it, called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And I'm telling you, Elijah, he just had a little streak of something in him. He just got cocky. In verse 27, we find, it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or Maybe he's on a journey or peradventure. He's asleep and he must be awaked. And they cried aloud and they cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. And now Elijah's finally about to get things in order in the kingdom. 
We find in verse 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. All the people came near unto him. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. The trench about the altar speaks of God's directive to the church to be separate from the world and the sin of the world. You see, church, when we partake of the gospel, we gain power and the will to choose to live differently. Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 6.14, you say, I don't know about all that separation business, but be ye unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In other words, quit living like the devil once you start living for God. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you. Ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Church family, what we really need to understand is our God will not accept us. In fact, he will reject us if we continue living like we've already, always lived after repenting, being baptized in the name of Jesus. You say, well, what about this name of Jesus? There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're going to be saved, it's going to be through the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. When you repent of your sins, when you're baptized in the name of Jesus, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and God gives you that special sign, and you know you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're not supposed to go back. And I'm not talking about you, you still got to go to work, you still got to do the things that you, you still got to live your life, but you got to live your life differently. You got to live your life for God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody remember Moses on Sinai? Anybody remember that? My goodness. We just passed Easter. You got to, you got to remember Moses on Sinai. I'm not talking about Charlton either. I'm talking about Moses was on Sinai. He's been there 40 days and nights fasting and praying. And then out of nowhere in Exodus 32, 7, we find, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down. (laughs) God is something else. He said, For thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's just, I just, I love this. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. After all they had seen and all they had experienced, they go back to worshiping those false gods. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. In other words, this is a proud people. Now, therefore, let me alone, Moses, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Thank God for an intercessor. Amen. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath Why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? You see how Moses turned it around. God's calling them Moses' people. And Moses said, no, they're your people. 
which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented. It wasn't as though the Lord had to repent. In other words, he just changed his mind of the evil which he thought to do unto his people or the, the path that he had chosen to take. One said, but God was finished with his people. God was done with them. Nope. That intercessor. Hallelujah. The Lord loves intercessors. The Lord loves people that will stand in the gap and make up the hedge. The Lord loves people that will pray as they're directed by the Holy Ghost and, and make changes where that person within themselves or that situation within itself <clears throat> could not be corrected, but because of an intercessor, that situation is corrected. That intercessor provides the fuel necessary for God to work the miracle. Also, aren't you glad we're now under grace? Amen. We might not deserve God's mercy. His mercy not be, might not be merited, and yet still we receive it. I, again, I say, I am so glad we're under grace. And back in 1 Kings 18.33, back to Elijah. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces, laid him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. Remember, we're in a, a drought, hadn't rained for three and a half years. Filling four barrel full of barrels full of water and just pouring it out on the sacrifice. But he doesn't stop there. Verse 34. And he said, do it a second time. And now we've got eight barrels of water poured out on the sacrifice. And, but he didn't stop there. He said, do it a third time. So they got 12 barrels of water poured out on the sacrifice. And the water ran round about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the God, Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. That wasn't a long prayer. I got that read in maybe 45 seconds. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. It consumed the wood. It even consumed the stones. It even consumed the dust. And he even licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. And they said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. I want to say to every single person in this building, every single person watching on the World Wide Web tonight, I want to say to all of you, Hallelujah. Nothing shall separate us from God's love. I want God's love. I must have God's love. I cannot make it without God's love. You know what? I love him back. I love him back. Hallelujah. He loved me when I was a sinner. Hallelujah. And I'm so thankful that he did. Hallelujah. Why don't you just lift your hands for a minute right now and thank the Lord for his love. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, mighty God, for your love. Thank you, mighty God, for your love.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, mighty God, for your love. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, mighty God, for loving me. Thank you, mighty God, for loving me. Mm. 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 Thank you, mighty God, for your love. Thank you, mighty God, for loving your people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that we'd all agree that Let's go ahead and stand. Hallelujah. I believe we'd all agree that there are times when life can throw curveballs at us. You know, and I remember Chuck when you was so sick and and God just brought you back, man. And you take you taking a licking and you keep on ticking, man. Hallelujah. I like that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Brother Paul, I remember a couple times when, hallelujah, you, your life was kind of in an unusual place, but God met you both times, didn't he? Hallelujah. God's great. God's great. Hallelujah. 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 And there are times when Life can just, and we're saying, what in the world's going on? This was the case for a Swedish couple, Stefan and Erika Svanstrom. They meticulously planned the perfect honeymoon, four-month travel tour to celebrate their love. And they must have had a little money if they took a four-month four honeymoon. <laughs> So they planned this out, but it didn't quite go according to plan. In Munich, they got stuck in an epic snowstorm that buried most of Europe under a blanket of snow that would be written about in future books. From there, they traveled to Cairns, Austria, Australia, only to be hit by a cyclone which forced them and thousands of others into public shelters to seek refuge. This honeymoon ain't going so good, is it? This may have been a sign of things to come, I don't know. They then made their way to Brisbane, only to find most of the city underwater from flooding of historic proportions. So they headed to Perth and found themselves fleeing rampant brush fires. Pushing on, they arrived in New Zealand find the country reeling from a 6.5 magnitude earthquake. That's not nothing to sneeze at. I've been in one of those. That's, not, that's nothing to sneeze at. In Bali, they braced for a monsoon, even so all seemed, things seemed to look bright as they landed in Tokyo. There they enjoyed two days in that amazing city when suddenly one of the largest earthquakes on record jolted Japan and spawned a devastating tsunami which in turn resulted in one of the most potentially dangerous nuclear disasters in modern history. You say, this can't be true. This is true. Amazingly, the couple survived their ongoing ordeal without injury and in or extraordinary good humor. At least, said Erica, we are fortunate when it comes to love. Love helped them keep it all in perspective. And it can do the same for us. No matter what we have to face in life, if we know Jesus, we know he's got our back. Amen? I'm going to wrap it up by reading one more passage. Romans 8.35, here it is. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword COVID I'm not supposed to add to or take away Forgive me. as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter 
Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Anybody here believe tonight that the Lord loves you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Have you got a thank offering down deep within your heart? I'm not talking about money now. I'm talking about you got a thank offering right now. Can you, can you offer up some thanks for the Lord's love? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. 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 Thank you, God, for loving us. Thank you, God, for loving us. Brother Mark, I was thinking about you last night, thinking about you a week ago, and how your mama prayed over every one of you kids. I'm telling you how many prayers your wife's prayed for you, and, and then your brother walks into the church the other night, and then prayers, then piled up prayers have been working. That's the love of God, man. That's the love of God. That's the love of God. Wow. Those prayers never die, folks. Those prayers never die. Lord, I'm so thankful for you meeting with us tonight. Lord, we've worshipped in song. We've, we've read. We hopefully understand a little more about your word. I ask you to go with us the rest of this week. Order our steps. Make our way perfect to God. Let it be, Lord God, according to your desire. I pray blessing upon your people tonight in a mighty way. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I love every one of you. You're dismissed.